Eddie George has won another Southern Heritage Classic, and he's pushing that same button that he pushed before the game. I want Jackson State back now. Oh, yeah. It's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South. Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor and current contributing writer at USA Today's Saints Wire. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey's over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S and ends with an S. Also follow me on Instagram at underscore mouth of the south for all of your daily clips and needs around the Saints and HBC. Use. We'll wrap up today's episode with a look at our HBCU rankings. Alabama State has plummeted. They are no longer, not even the number one team, they're no longer even top 10. <sighs> now, in segment two, we'll be looking at Grambling's defense because Grambling's defense showed a whole lot of backbone against Texas A&M Commerce, and they're a big reason, if not the biggest reason, that the Tigers were able to walk away with a big-time victory. But speaking of some Tigers who walked away with some big-time victories, I'm talking about the Tennessee State Tigers, Eddie George and company. And guess what? After his second straight Southern Heritage Classic, he went ahead and pushed that same button that he pushed before. I want Jackson State back. We need to play Jackson State. I think that he was a, a little bit more covert with it this time. I thought that he was a little bit more subtle. But it's quite clear who he wants to be Tennessee State's opponent in the following or, well, I guess next year and ongoing Southern Heritage Classic. So, the reason that this is a conversation is that UAPB signed a two-year contract. This weekend or last weekend was their second game, which means they have to re-up their contract if they're going to be in the Southern Heritage Classic moving forward. In other words, Tennessee State is still here, but they don't know who they're facing. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Eddie George is pushing this button that he's pushing now. He didn't push it last year. Like, Granted, it was the first time, but still. He's, he's telling you repeatedly, I want this game. Not only do I want this game, I want it on the Southern Heritage Classic. Let's listen to the words that Eddie George said after the game. So he said, let's keep this thing going. Let's figure it out. If we can get that game back with Jackson State, that would be phenomenal. If we get Arkansas or Pine Bluff, that would be great. If there's another HBCU, that's great too. But it'll be a shame if this ends and there's no opponent. It's been a fab. It's been the fabric of college football, period. When you play in classics like this, this is what it's all about. Now, there's a couple of key words in here, and I can tell exactly what his process is. I think he likes playing UAPB. I genuinely do. I don't think that it's and grant. I'm just reading this. I'm not hearing it. So there's emphasis and inflictions that will really tell how he feels. But even by reading it, I can tell that UAPB is not his first choice. I think it's an acceptable choice, but it's not the place or it's not the team he'd want to face if he had a choice. If he had a choice, it'd be Jackson State and not just at any time. He'd play Jackson State in the Southern Heritage Classic because listen to how he says it after he says we need to we need to figure it out. Because remember, there is no Southern Heritage of uh, Southern. Excuse me. There is no Southern Heritage Classic opponent for Tennessee State in 2025. That has not been decided. It could be UAPB, it could be uh, Jackson State, it could be North Carolina Central, it could be Howard, right? It, it could be anybody. They don't know who is going to be in 2025. Eddie George is just putting his name out there as saying, I want Jackson State. If we can get that game back with Jackson State, that would be phenomenal. If we get Arkansas Pine Bluff, that would be great. Now I'll let you pick. What's better, great or phenomenal? Which one sounds like you're more excited, great or phenomenal? I, to me, it's quite obvious. It's not even close. If I say something's phenomenal, I say something's great. Yeah, I enjoy it. But when put next to phenomenal, it pales in comparison. We clearly know which one's the top. And it's Jackson State. This is who he wants to play in this game. You know, even if there's another HBCU, that's great too. Reading it, it sounds like Jackson State, big gap, UAPB decent sized gap 
another HBCU. And maybe that has to do with the fact that you've played UAPB twice. It's been good games. You know, they, like it hasn't been blowouts. They've been entertaining. But another HBCU, you kind of got to get to know them. You got to get to know the fan base and see how they interact and things like that. Maybe you just feel like UAPB works. It's just not ideal. But you know what? This isn't because Tennessee State won the game again. It isn't because they swept them in this two-year contract. That has absolutely nothing to do with it. That has absolutely nothing to do with it. He wants to play Jackson State. He wants to play JSU so much, he talked about it before the game. This is what he says before the game in the Big South OVC press conference. He says, we used to play Jackson State. That's the natural rival for this matchup. Hopefully, somewhere down the line, we will look at reigniting that rivalry game against Jackson State, whether it's in the Southern Heritage Classic or some other type of classic. That's a game we need to play. Before this game is up, now granted, Eddie George understands. He's a businessman, right? Eddie George is a businessman who understands that contracts are about to end. If that contract is about to end and there's not another one signed, that means everybody's on the table. And if everybody's on the table, I'm saying I want that person. Let's try to get that done again. So I get it. But this is before the game. He's telling you, hopefully somewhere down the line, we'll look at reigniting that rivalry game, whether it's in the Southern Heritage Classic or some other classic. That's a game we need to play. He is telling me, I don't care if it's the SHC. Ugh, that was a mouthful saying that as a letter. I don't care if it's the Southern Heritage Classic. I don't care. That's why I would like it to be because that's what we do, right? We meet up in Memphis and we fight it out in the Southern Heritage Classic. But it don't have to be that. At the end of the day, we just need to play Jackson State because Tennessee State versus Jackson State is important to those fan bases. It's important to my fan base. He's speaking for himself, right? Like that is the tone of what he's speaking about before the game, after the game. One thing is crystal clear. He wants to play Jackson State in the Southern Heritage Classic, and he's not shy about going on the record about it. He said that it will be phenomenal compared to everybody else being great. Yes, that simple change of a word, that simple semantics, it does matter. It tells you the excitement level that he has for Jackson State versus everybody else. Everybody else. I don't care who it is. Anybody else. It's not Jackson State. He comes and says, I don't care if it's in the Southern Heritage Classic or if it's in some other classic. We need to play the game. Not only is the Southern Heritage Classic important, just facing Jackson State is a pivotal move for Tennessee State. This is the coach. Now, in this year's matchup between him and or them and UAPB, Jalen Ellis went crazy. It's the second game this season in which he had uh, three touchdowns. It's the second game in the, in, uh, in the season in which he completed 20 passes. The only one where this didn't happen was against North Dakota State. That was a rough one, but that's okay. In this game, <laughs> he had... 21, or excuse me, 20 completions for 33, 20 out of 33 completions, excuse me, for 228 yards and three touchdowns. It's the second three touchdown game, second 20 completion game, and it also resulted in his second Big South OVC player of the week. He shared this one. He was a co-player of the week in this week's or after this week's matchup. So I'm really excited because the two teams he faced, they're not necessarily top level HBCUs, right? Like this is UAPB who I don't think I think they could be tough. They could be gritty, but I don't think anybody's looking at them as a top dog. And the other one is Mississippi Valley State. So we're not looking at upper echelon. But at the same time, you you only play who you go against. And good teams are supposed to do that against bad teams, right? So I think that Draylon Ellis has played very well. And if he can continue this going into conference play, oh, we having a different conversation about the Tigers going into maybe being conference championship contenders. Maybe being playoff contenders. Not like this is if you win the championship, the conference championship, you're automatically in the playoffs. So um, yeah, I I think that if he can contain, if he can maintain his level of play, Tennessee State's gonna be a good team. They are. They're gonna be a good team. Um, Sanders Ellis. I don't know if there's any relation there. Um, they're not from the same hometown. Sanders is from Memphis, but he was co-freshman of the week because he had two and a half tackles for a loss and one and a half sacks. That D-line was getting after UAPB. They were. I thought they did a really good job. I enjoyed the amount of the game that I was able to watch because we were splitting time between all of the different matchups, um, trying to watch everybody can be a hassle at times. But we get it done for the love of the game, yeah? So anyway, he and a couple of his other teammates tie at the top of the list of the team for four tackles for a loss this season. So he, he's been one of the more effective players. He's a linebacker who knows how to get downhill, who knows how to get behind the line of scrimmage and knows how to, and knows how to make an impact. 
He's only a freshman. And I think that all of these traits were on display in the Southern Heritage Classic. So shout out to Sanders Ellis. Shout out to Draylon Ellis. Matter of fact, shout out to Tracy Ellis Ross. Matter of fact, I, shout out everybody. Uh, shout out. Uh, I didn't know, know any more Ellis's. I went to Ellis Elementary back in the day. Shout out Ellis Elementary, too. But let's go ahead and move to Grambling because Grambling's defense showed a whole lot of backbone against Texas A&M Commerce. And for my money, they were the biggest reason that they were able to win this game against Commerce. So let's break down how impactful in their biggest moments as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. And FanDuel is the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Now, the NFL season is here we rolling. And listen to me and listen to me good. You have until Sunday, September 22nd, to use, or excuse me, to go to FanDuel.com, make a $5 bet, you'll get three weeks free of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube or YouTube TV. As a person who uses this on a daily basis and wishes that he didn't buy it before that three-week trial came out, this is the move. This is what you want to do. Go and put some money down on week three action. We have a game for Thursday night. You have Sunday night's worth of action, Uh, Sunday day, Sunday night. Then you also have Monday night. Everything is rolling. It's the NFL season. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the best thing to ever happen for a, a course of, what, four or five months? Oh, it's beautiful. So go ahead and take part of that and get you a little bit of free NFL Sunday ticket. So not only do you get to make money off it, you also get to watch it for free for three weeks. So go to Locked On. Or excuse me, go to FanDuel.com slash Locked On to make every moment more. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. And this is the place to go for all of your ticket needs, right? I have a... Uh, so, you know, the Saints been succeeding, you know, because I've been telling you every Monday. So uh, I'm happy about that. But the ticket prices have jumped. The, the excitement around the team has jumped. Guess who went to game time early and got his tickets? Yes, indeed. So I'll be at the New Orleans Saints versus Tampa Bay Buccaneers game for a much better price than anybody who's buying it. However, if the tickets were well, because the tickets have jumped, I would even stronger, strongly suggest more strongly suggest. Yeah, more strongly suggest that you go to Game Time and download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On CFB because you get twenty dollars off your first purchase. So those jumping prices, you may get a little bit farther down to where it was when I got my tickets. Not to rub it in your face, but to give you a little bit of advice. Go ahead and go to, <laughs> go ahead and go to Game Time. Download the app, create an account, and use the code Locked On CFB to get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Trust me, once you go, you will not regret it. As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day every day. For your second listen, make sure you're checking out Locked on. Who are we going to shout out today? Shout out Locked on Gators. Yeah, shout, shout out Locked on Gators. My guy Brandon Olsen does great content, so they're going with a lot of turmoil. If you want to hear the drama, go ahead and check them out. Um but today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Grambling's defense was absolutely locked down, and they showcased why they should be a threat moving forward in the SWAC. If Grambling's defense can play how they play on Saturday, when the SWAC comes around, we're having a completely different conversation because their ability to generate turnovers. Is the greatest equalizer that you can have in football. Imagine giving up three turnovers of your own and you still winning the turnover battle two to one. Imagine that, right? Like uh, imagine that you cough up the ball multiple times and you still win the turnover battle. That's what Gramlin's defense was able to do because they caused six turnovers on Saturday in the matchup against Texas A&M Commerce. This was, this was a really good game. It ended in overtime. Grambling versus Texas A&M Commerce, not Converse, not Chuck Taylor's, but Grambling versus Texas A&M Commerce ended in an overtime victory for the Tigers in which the last play of the game was an interception. I don't think there was a more appropriate ending or a more appropriate finale of any game on the HBCU slate, at least. When you're looking at it, they caught it on the first play of Commerce's drive which is ironic because you look at the first interception they had, it was on the first play of the second drive, the next interception on the first play of the third drive. This is what they do in this game, especially they were able to continuously force turnovers. I want to go ahead and take a look at it and let's look at the first, I think seven drives. If we're able to take a look at the first seven drives that Texas A&M commerce had, then we'll be looking at just how 
dominant it almost feels like that defense was to start the game and i understand that they had 28 points but two of those touchdowns came off of short fields right whether that was uh turnovers by grambling and grambling didn't do a good job of really capitalizing off the turnovers that they were given either they did not do a good job of that if they did this game would have never went to overtime but let's look at it so on the first drive commerce went three plays eight yards three and out second play or second drive one play interception third drive one play interception fourth drive three plays a fumble the next drive two plays 75 yards they scored a touchdown on that one a quick strike too then the next one you get four plays on a short field they got that that uh they started that possession in grambling territory on the 45 four plays nine yards turnover on downs the next drive three plays one yard and it was an inter Interception. That's the first seven possessions. Punt, three and out. Interception, interception, fumble, touchdown, turnover on downs, another interception. That's three. That's the and that's the entire first quarter. Gramlin wasn't doing great. Gramlin's offense was not doing great because that's Texas AM Commerce had one, two, three, four, five, six possessions. They had six possessions in the first quarter. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of possessions that's a lot of time to touch the football in the first quarter right so it but grambling's defense held up grambling's defense held up so you're looking at six total turnovers four interceptions two fumbles they returned one of those fumbles for a touchdown that actually was the first points on the board by either team so that was also a big reason on why they had six um possessions because you know not like you really have to turn over the ball. You, you know what I mean? Like you, you, Gramlin's offense didn't touch the field because Gramlin returned it for a touchdown. But overall, two of those touchdowns that they scored came on short field. So that's 14 of the 28 points. You obviously had that big drive, two plays, 75 yards. It was a, a quick strike, of course. Um, but overall, Gramlin's defense is going crazy in this game. <laughs> and I think more important than anything, you had this one play, and it was made by Brandon Bar or Brendan Barley. Commerce was looking to put the game away. There was about three, three and a half minutes left on the clock. It was a fourth and short. I think it was fourth and two. And they ran the ball. First off, they were in field goal range. I think that Commerce didn't really trust their field goal team because it wasn't the first time that they went for it. It wasn't the first time they went for it in field goal range. But, hey, whatever. It works. They were trying to put that game away. And getting a getting a first down would have went a long way as far as waiting down the clock. Um but they went for a fourth and sh short up seven. Brendan Barley shot through the gap, made a tackle, and was able to get him down. I think he ended up getting like fall, falling forward for like maybe a yard, but it was fourth and two. So that one yard that he was able to fall, that the running back was able to fall forward, meant nothing. Barley also had the first interception of the game. It, it, it was a really good performance by that defense. And you close it out with an interception in overtime major victory by grambling you have to give a lot of kudos to that defense because the offense was not really firing at all on that day the offense was not handling business in the way that you would like them to not in a way that a a swack offensive player of the year led offense should be doing you know um that has to change i think they still like their running game I'm really bouncing between whether or not I want to make Grambling versus Jackson State my game of the week. I don't know. I don't know. There's a I'm I'm going through two options. It's Howard versus Hampton and it's Grambling versus Jackson State. If y'all respond quick enough and I get enough people telling me which one they would like, I would choose based off what the viewers want to hear. But I'm going to be warm with that over like the next day, day and a half on well, day because I have to make that decision by the time Thursday's episode comes out. So this this will be interesting. This will be interesting. But I think that this is going that's going to be a good game. Anyway, Gramlin's defense and their ability to force turnovers, even though Gramlin missed on the first two. Right. Like they I think they fumbled one away. Then they missed the field goal. Like It just it wasn't good. Gramlin's defense had to take it into their own hands. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me see. Oh, yeah, no, they punt it. They punt it? Punted the ball after that? Must have been a deeper shot. Anyway, Grambling's defense was balling. They made up for the, the, the offense not getting it together until late in the game, but I think this is going to be a solid team. 
I think it's going to be a solid team if they can continue doing that. So as we push forward, we're going to look at Alabama State plummeting down these HBCU rankings because the team that was once number one, they still got a one in their rankings. It just went from one to 11. And we'll continue and talk about that as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Roy, a.k.a. Return on You. I love this because it allows you to directly support the players. At the end of the day, NIL has completely changed the way that we absorb college football and college athletics in general. That's not going anywhere. So why not be invested and involved in it in the way that you can? Say you have a player who you want to make sure stays with the team. You want to throw a couple extra dollars his way. Maybe that'll, uh, maybe that'll sway his decision or sway her decision. You go ahead and go to Roy. And here's the beautiful part. Fan contributions are securely held and only distributed if the athlete makes the decision that the fan wants. If not, the money's returned back to you. Ain't no risk in that. Ain't no risk in that. So you go ahead and get the Roy app for iOS or Android and start making an impact on your favorite team. Use the referral code locked on for an opportunity to win five thousand dollars cash and join. Or you can visit joinroy.com for more opportunities and for more details. No purchase is necessary. Void where prohibited. Get off the sidelines and into the NIL deal with Roy. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day, every day, making it all the way to segment three. And I thank you two times for that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get into these HBCU rankings because Alabama State has plummeted down the rankings you're looking at a team that once upon a time was number one i think it's important to remember where they are and where they started this team was at number one they were the best team in hbcu football ranking wise to start the season and regardless if you agree with that or not they were on the short list of teams who were in that rotation i would say if you compiled all of the list from prominent agencies maybe even a couple of uh lesser known Alabama State was probably top three, four consensus, right? Like that's where they were for the most part. And I understand there's a lot of things that went into that. But after the first loss to North Carolina Central, they dropped down to four. Then they go from four and they stay there for a minute. They beat Miles. You know, you beat Miles. Okay, that's not going to lift you, but it's also not going to drop you. because You came up with a victory. And I thought that the offense looked decent in that game. I wouldn't say it looked great, but. You were able to put up points, which is more than you can say about some other people, right? Um, now you lose this game to um, to Sanford. You lose to Sanford, and you drop from 4 to 11. And now we're getting concerned. It's like the ace. You was 1, now you 11. Which one are you going to be? At the end of the year, are you going to be 1 or are you going to be 11? Probably not either 1, but which one are you going to be closer to? 1 or 11. Actually, I still think they have a chance to be 1. They have a bye week this week. They got to get it right. Here's the thing. This game versus Sanford showcased everything that they've been for the last couple of years. Great defense, no offense. And if you're going to be that, you're not going to be an upper echelon team. Here's the thing about Alabama State. Alabama State for the last two years has been a tough out, but they've never been top tier. They've never been upper echelon. And the reason they haven't been that, because they haven't had an offense to match up with their dominant defense, right? Right. Now, you go and get Andrew Body. I'm thinking you're going to be championship contenders. Obviously, Body isn't there anymore. Even Jonah O'Brien, who you had as your uh, number one A quarterback, he's out now, too. Against Wagner, or excuse me, against Sanford, you didn't look like a team that could generate any offense. And that just puts you right back to where you were these past couple of years. And that's the tough part, is that I believe in Alabama State's supporting cast on defense. But what you going to do offensively? Are you going to be able to throw the ball? Are you going to be able to, I know they like having deep shots with that freshman quarterback. Are you going to be able to be a, a consistent explosive offense, a boom or bust offense? Cause right now you just busting pause, pause. Whoa. I said it in my head. It didn't sound crazy until I said it out loud. Oh, ugh. anyway, are you gonna be a boom or bust offense? Cause I can live with that. If I know you're going to give me a deep shot every, every game, right. Or every other game, you're going to give me a couple of deep shots. I can live with that. I'm not going to like it, but at this point, we can't be we can't be choosy. You got to just take it how you live, and that's how it's going to be. Or are you going to be a strong run game team? Here's the thing. I'm not I'm not counting anybody out until we get to swipe play. Once you get to swipe play, if you start struggling there, then I'm starting to count you out. What you do out of conference, what you do out of conference is the beginning of the year. Um, 
you're not facing your peers necessarily. I say that with air quotes and hopes and no disrespect, but your peers as in the sense of who you're really competing with throughout the year. But for Alabama State, that starts next week, not this week. They have a bye week. But next week, September 28th, they face Bethune-Cookman. I'm liable to make that my game of the week. I'm not going to, but it'll be a prominent feature on that Thursday. And uh, the 28th, I've seen a couple of games that I like a little bit more than that. So it won't be the game of the week. But trust and believe, it'll probably be the opening segment on Thursday the 26th. Yeah, it'll probably be an opening segment on that. Because it's a game I want to watch. Alabama State has to generate some sort of offense in that game. If they don't, it's going to be a difficult conversation. If they don't generate offense, it's going to be a difficult conversation when talking about their championship aspirations. This is what Stan Beckton, who does the list, had to say about them. Alabama State looked lost without either their quarterbacks from week one. If they don't figure out that position soon, they might not make it to the Magic City Classic with a winning record. It's simple. I can't disagree with them. If you don't have a quarterback, you don't generate offense. You have to find something. Run the game. Run the ball. Be able to pass something. If you can't do any of that, you're not going to be a good team, period. Now, you look at the rest of the top five. You got Jackson State, FAMU, Tennessee State, North Carolina Central, Morgan State. So with the Hornets dropping out, Morgan State jumps in. It's funny because I could say the same thing about Morgan State, and they do. But when you hold a FBS opponent to 21, get a little bit more credit for it. They need to figure out their offense, too. Uh, North Carolina Central dropped down to four. That was a little bit surprising to me. But Tennessee State jumps to three. My thing about Tennessee State is I feel like I see this frequently. Whether it's Tennessee State or Hampton, I see this frequently. They, they're high on this list. They play HBCUs who aren't that great. Like, they're not highly ranked. Um, ironically, Hampton and, and Tennessee State will both play Howard. But they play HBCUs that aren't great, like Valley, UAPB, Norfolk State. Like, they play these schools. They win, and they get praised for it. I don't know. I don't think we – I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think anybody else on this list – I don't think anybody outside of an HBCU conference gets praised for knocking off Valley and UAPB or Norfolk State. I don't think that those are wins that HBCUs and HBCU conferences get credit for. But I think with Hampton, North Carolina A&T, Tennessee State, with them being outside of HBCU conferences, they get inflated with these things. But then again, they have to deal with facing teams that other HBCUs don't. So then they get naturally deflated for it. So I guess I can I can I can deal with it because I understand where it comes from. But like I said in the segment one, if Draylon Ellis keeps playing like this, Tennessee State may keep in that top three. They'll stay in that top five because there'll be a real, real competitor in the Big South OVC. Now, on tomorrow's episode, we'll be looking at the games that aren't our game of the week but we're still highlighting i'm telling you i don't know grambling versus jackson state hampton versus howard which one should be my game of the week which one should i prioritize on thursday Aye, i guess we'll find out tomorrow until the next time that we talk to each other family take care stay blessed peace